Hello, everybody. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces back on the uh, on the screen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're uh, where you're tuning in from. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure and honor today to introduce Dr. Liana Fix uh, speaking to us from uh, from Berlin. So, good afternoon, um, uh, almost a good evening to, to Dr. Mm -hmm. Fix, um, who is. Um, a leading voice in Europe uh, and in Germany on questions related to European security, uh, to Ukraine uh, and uh, to Russia. Dr. Fix is program director at the Kerber Foundation uh, in Berlin. And also something that's quite relevant to today's conversation is the author of a book uh, titled A New German Power Question Mark. I'm using the word question mark, that's not the title. A New German Power Question Mark, Germany's uh, role in European uh, Russia policy. This was published in 2022, so two years before today, and obviously well before the 2022 invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia. So um, it has uh, a little bit the aura uh, of a historical document, um, and that has a lot of value uh, in and of itself. And I know uh, from my many discussions with Dr. Fix uh, that she's able to connect in a hundred different ways the thesis and the argument of her book with developments uh, in the present tense. So we'll very much look forward to your questions and observations, sort of comments, um, maybe 40, 45 minutes from now. Although if anybody has a kind of urgent or burning question, please just raise your hand and jump in. We don't want to make anything too formal. Uh, but I thought that we would start with something of a historical review of the topic uh, and then take it to 2014 think then about the period between 2014 and February 24th, 2022, and then conclude uh, with a lot of the big questions that Germany faces and that are facing Germany um, in the summer of 2022. So first of all, welcome Dr. Fix. Uh, and um, you know, having made the introduction, I'll now call her Liana, but I didn't want to be too uh, informal from the beginning. But uh, I wanted to start Liana with a question about the 1990s. Obviously there's a way in which Germany is at the very center of the story uh, from 1989 to 1991, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the question of Germany's reunification, then the question of German, uh, reunified Germany in uh, NATO negotiations with the Soviet Union, uh, and, uh, and then the appearance of a Russian Federation, uh, and all of these post-Soviet states in the early 1990s. When you think back, uh, Liana, to the early 1990s in terms of the prehistory of your topic in the book, what do you think are the most important themes, sort of questions or, or patterns to consider? Thanks so much, Michael, and hello again to everyone. It's a pleasure to um, have this discussion with you. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and let me start jump to jump right um, away into the 1990s. It's particularly easy because I'm sitting here at um, Pariser Platz in Berlin, just uh, if I look out of my window, I see the Brandenburg Gate, which is really the symbol for German reunification. This was where the wall went through, which separated um, Germany's East and West. And that's actually also a good point to starting point to answer, to answer your question, Michael, because I think there's one crucial point that separates um, Germany's trajectory after 99 from the trajectory of the Central and Eastern European countries in its neighborhood. And the central point why Germany has a different position on Russia and has developed a different position on Russia is the historical reconciliation that Germany was able to build up with Russia after 1990. It had the time and it had the context to do so, which other countries further east, which also escaped the Soviet sphere of influence um, and the Warsaw Pact didn't. So what do I mean by this? I mean that for Germany's quick reunification process, the whole of Germany, including, including East Germany, became member of the EU and NATO because German reunification was basically an extension of the structures that were there to the east. So after reunification and after the withdrawal of the last um, Soviet troops from German territory, Germany was relatively quickly in a comfort comfortable situation. It was um, uh, part of the EU and NATO. It had a security umbrella. It had a great economic uh, economic cooperation with EU within the EU. Um, and it was basically a stroke of luck and a very rapid leap towards stability, prosperity, and security 
where as the countries you know of central and eastern europe had it more had more difficulties you know they had to go to a painful process of the eu and nato accession and they didn't have this window of opportunity to work on historical reconciliation with russia which Germany had. It started with um, Kohl and Gorbachev, um, but then it was also continued by Gerhard Schröder and by Vladimir Putin. Really this idea that, you know, after the Second World War, after the Cold War times, now Germany and Russia can finally uh, become uh, friendly states, become friendly neighbors. Russia was always called as a neighbor from Germany's perspective. And finally, Germany was able to make peace um, out of you know the guilt of the second world war and the gratitude towards Gorbachev who allowed this re reconciliation and from this perspective one also understands why relations with other countries from the region with the states that followed from the soviet union never had the same level of priority as relations with russia and that continued into the years from 2008 2014 where Russia was always, from a German perspective, above all the other countries in its strategic foreign policy priorities. Wonderful. We can circle back to a point that's implicit, I think, to your comments, which is that historical reconciliation in the 1990s and for quite a long time thereafter in Germany was really historical reconciliation, as you put it, with Russia uh, and not historical reconciliation with Ukraine, which is a debate, of course, of the last uh, couple of years, but uh, let's save that point for a little bit later because it takes us closer to the present moment. But it's very important, I think, for us to note <laughs> the, the semantic and political distinction between Russia uh, and Ukraine. In a sense, this was, uh, you could say, simpler. The, the politics of memory was a little bit simpler when there was a Soviet Union, because that was the entity that was at war in the, uh, in the Second World War, and you could kind of deal with things on, uh, on that level. The breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, in 1991 introduced interesting problems of uh, of historical memory for uh, for Germany. Could you speak a little bit, thinking now more maybe more toward the late 1990s, um, about on the one hand Germany's uh, aspirations and policies toward Europe, the kind of Europe that Germany was hoping to see in the late 1990s, and then moving away perhaps a bit from the question of memory and historical reconciliation, the relationship between uh, Germany and Boris Yeltsin's. Uh, Russia. It's of course not until New Year's Eve 1991 that Putin becomes um, uh, the Russian president. So when we're speaking in the 1990s, we're speaking about we're speaking about Yeltsin's Russia, obviously. But so, how would you sort of understand the contours of the of of, of, of basic German policy toward Europe on the one hand and Russia on the other in the late 1990s? Yeah. So what is interesting that after the 1990s, the main theme. Of you know, in German foreign policy for wider Europe was a cooperative security structure. So this, this kind of European security architecture, cooperative security structure um, from, you know, these famous uh, quotes from Lissabon to Wostock, we will create a pan-European space. This was incredibly dominant in the discourse at that time. And it's interesting that um, uh, you mentioned Yeltsin, that the domestic difficulties within Russia were actually perceived as um, a destabilizing, uh, destabilizing force that could sort of counter this idea of a cooperative security architecture. So if we look back at how Helmut Kohl at that time looked at NATO um, Eastern enlargement, um, when the Soviet Union broke apart, he was quite skeptical, but he later changed his stance because from his perspective, um, nationalist tendencies in Russia the insecurity, would Yeltsin be reelected? Would we have nationalist forces in Russia which would sort of reclaim the Soviet sphere? For him, that was a reason to argue for the enlargement of the EU and NATO, and not only out of, you know, out of a sense of responsibility for those countries, but also because he was very aware that Germany um, is still the front line, was still the front line state at the time, and he didn't want that role for Germany. So, from that perspective, Eastern enlargement, especially of NATO, sort of created this ring of friends and this uh, stability around Germany. And this was something which Kohl at the time um, actively, actively pursued. He didn't want Germany to be a frontline state within NATO anymore at that time. 
And then when uh, Cole departed the scene, um, Schröder, Gerhard Schröder at that time, who obviously has a very different <laughs> legacy nowadays, um, at that time, he saw Germany as the main advocate for relations with Russia within the European Union. So the main structure for Germany's vision of Europe was obviously European Union and ever closer union, more integration. But the idea was always that Russia needed a space within and a place within this um, pan-European security architecture. That's why Germany also supported the NATO Russia Council, the NATO Russia Founding Act. This was something which, from a German perspective, satisfied satisfied this 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 need to somehow find a place for for Russia for Russia in Europe. And Gerhard Schröder basically continued um, what Helmut Kohl did, although you know, he had a different party affiliation. He was the first Social Democratic Chancellor after 16 years of Helmut Kohl. And he placed the same kind of emphasis on energy relations with Russia as a stabilizing factor for East-West relations. And that's, especially from a perspective of, of today, um, that's so interesting that actually energy questions like Nord Stream 1 or Nord Stream 2 never were apolitical or just economic questions. They were even in Cold War times and also afterwards in the 90s and in the 2000s perceived as a political instrument to stabilize relations between East and West. And that's why Gerhard Schröder was a strong supporter of, of Nord Stream 1 and of the close energy relationship. And with Vladimir Putin, and that's perhaps the last remark, um, from a German perspective, someone entered the Kremlin with whom the future of Russia was still not predetermined. So from a German perspective, it was possible that Vladimir Putin could become the reformer of Russia, could become someone who brings Russia closer to Europe. And that was um, continued basically until, surprisingly, until 2011, 2012, at a time when others you know, have lost all illusions about Russia. It was this entire period from the beginning of the 2000s, almost a decade, when there was hope in Berlin, the future of Russia is still open. And we, as the most important power in Europe, can contribute to nudge Russia into the right direction in its development. It's wonderful, just because it's nice to do these things, I think, for the sake of our students, there's a very natural point of connection between what Liana just said a moment ago about some of Helmut Kohl's concerns uh, about Yeltsin's Russia and a speaker that we're going to have shortly, Mary Sarati, who's written a terrific, widely discussed uh, recent book, Not One Inch, about NATO expansion. And she emphasizes the importance of Russia's war with Chechnya in the 1990s as changing the dynamic where countries, maybe a bit more to the east of Germany, but including Germany, started to worry about a revanchist Russia. And started to see NATO expansion, uh, not just as something that would integrate Europe and spread democracy, but that might potentially protect Europe uh, against a kind of resurgent uh, Russia or a Russia going down the wrong path. So that's a point that we could link perhaps from this conversation to the one that we'll have uh, uh, soon with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Mary uh, Sarati. I just want to work, work through with you since we're sort of taking these steps, you know, kind of one by one. Uh, not quite going to 2011, as you mentioned, the sort of turning point uh, in German perceptions of Russia, but sticking a little bit uh, more to the period before that. And I don't know if this is a discrete period in German foreign policy, but 2000 to 2007. So Putin arrives on the scene, is perceived, as you say, uh, as a modernizer in Germany. Obviously, the relationship between Gerhard Schroeder and Vladimir Putin is something that still exists uh, to this day. is an important personal relationship, but uh, it's an important bilateral relationship as well. Uh, and probably the most significant, certainly the most significant development of this period from a German point of view is September 11th and the US war in Iraq, beginning in the spring of 2003, Yashka Fischer's famous statement at the Munich Security Conference that he's not convinced by the presentation of Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, in retrospect, he wasn't convinced for, for good reason. So a certain, not a break between Germany and the United States, but uh, a new level of tension uh, between countries that had been up until this point very close partners, uh, a sense that uh, Putin could be uh, a, a modernizer. Could you sort of speak about the main trend lines of this period? I used 2007, that's sort of Putin's speech at the Munich Security Conference, um, which is directed more at the US than, than it is at Germany, but I see that also as a kind of division point and 
I'll pick up the thread after that. But sort of 2000 to 2007, a problematic United States and a kind of interesting Russia. Is that a, is that a fair paraphrase? I think it is. And I think if we look back at that time, this um, approach of the Schroeder government, having very close relations to Russia, being very close to Vladimir Putin as the new partner, and at the same time being critical of the United States was quite some, yeah, quite a novel development because before Germany's path, you know, towards West integration, I mean, there were these two big lines in German foreign policy, West integration and Eastern policy. This West integration was always sort of the anchor. It was the most important aspect and um, in, you know, German feuilletons, but also in policy circles. Back then, Gerhard Schröder's move away from the United States was also discussed as, as is he moving away from West integration, integration into the transatlantic alliance as the main pillar of German foreign policy? Is he trying to position Germany back as some a country which is somehow in between the West and Russia and trying to build a bridge between the West and Russia? Those were the discussions that were, were taking place at the time um, and uh, which yeah, were also discussions which related back to Germany's broader, broader role at the time within Europe. Um, would it be able to you know, take a leadership role in the European Union to a stronger extent than it has done so in the past? So this, um, this is very much linked to the person of Gerhard Schröder himself, who was perceived as someone who could modernize German foreign policy at the time. And for those who didn't agree of this kind of modernization, moving a little bit further away from the transatlantic alliance, this was quite a, yeah, a revolutionary break with tradition. But the problem was that because of this close relationship between uh, Putin, Gerhard Schröder, and this really, you know, uh, perhaps two personal relationship, um, any warning signals that some observers have, you know, identified, <laughs> obviously the Chechen wars, you mentioned it, but then also the, the background of Vladimir Putin as a KGB officer who warned, well, is this really the person who will lead Russia into a democratic and modern future? Or is this the person that will fall back on its initial instincts? These warnings were ignored at that time. And that's why also the Bundestag speech of Putin, where he accused the West of you know, uh, ignoring the, the, the hand that Russia uh, gave to the West um, was quite a shock to the uh, Berlin uh, foreign policy community and to the wider public at that time, because it was perceived as, well, did we actually do something wrong? We invested so much in this historical reconciliation and in the relationship with Russia that um, uh, why is there suddenly such an anger? Because this sort of idea that some of the imperialist instincts in Russian foreign policy could sort of reawaken was there in Central and Eastern Europe, but it was not there in Germany. And at that time, we really see how Honestly, we have to say towards Poland, towards the Baltic states and other Eastern neighbors, Germany had quite a patronizing relationship. So it was very clear that Germany is leading policy towards Europe. I mean, with the Eastern enlargement in 2004, when Poland entered the stage, they were perceived as a nuisance, as the ones who were spoiler in EU relations towards Russia. Um, and uh, especially in the run up to the Georgia war in 2008, um, it became very clear that the perception of Russia in the east of the EU and in the west of the EU were completely different. It's such important history for understanding the present because, um, you know, a lot of these frustrations that one sees at the present moment in, in Eastern Europe are not just a function of the 2022 war, but have exactly, as you indicate, uh, a substantial prehistory uh, and they have uh, they have real roots. We'll have time in a moment, I think, to speak about some of the frustrations of the Southern Europeans with Germany. We'll catalog all of Europe's frustrations with Germany in, 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 in due course, but uh, that I think also flows into the story. But that's not a shorter motif. That's a, that's an Anglo American motif of of, uh, of Germany's connection to Europe. I just want to go through now the sort of the next chapter of the drama. Um, you know, sort of improvising periodization as we go along. Two thousand seven, Putin's speech to the Munich Security Council, that's the Security Conference, 
Uh, and then 2013, November 2013, which I understand as um, an absolutely pivotal event, uh, pivotal moment in the history of Europe. I'll dramatize for a second. And this is Yanukovych not signing the association agreement in Vilnius in November of 2013, which sets in motion, of course, the Maidan uh, uprising of the next few months, the fall of, or rather the flight of Yanukovych to, uh, to Russia, a new government in Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, uh, et cetera, you know, really momentous events uh, in 2014, but, but triggered by something that happens in, uh, in 2013. So what I want to disentangle in this period is I think um, it's not, it's interesting how, how much um, variety there is in this story. So you have <clears throat> Schroeder drawing a bit closer to Russia, um, difficulties between Berlin and Washington uh, in these years. Uh, and then you have a new chapter where Barack Obama comes to power in uh, January of 2009. Uh, he spends part of his campaign in Berlin, famously sort of appearing between the, uh, before the Siegesäule. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Barack Obama has now and had then in 2008 a wide sort of base of popular support in Germany. Uh, and we know that for Obama, the relationship with Angela Merkel is going to be a very close one. And I think it's um, a fair way to characterize Merkel's relationship uh, to uh, Obama's as well. So one of the things that happens after this period up until 20, 2007 is that there's a, a sort of reconstitution of the US uh, German relationship. Uh, you mentioned Putin's speech to the, <coughs> to the Bundestag, um, but there's also his speech in Munich um, where he decries the kind of international order that the US is trying to construct, accuses the US of being uh, disruptive uh, and in very sharp language before figures like Senator McCain uh, and others, you know, sort of indicates that there'll be a new period of conflict between uh, Russia uh, and the United States. Um, and at the same time, this is the period of the Eastern Partnership Program. Uh, that's an EU program. And if I understand correctly, it was sort of spearheaded by Sweden and Poland or by by Carl Bildt uh, and Radek Sikorsky, a Swedish and a Polish diplomat, respectively. Uh, and I was wondering if you could speak about this period, sort of 2007, 2013. Obviously, there are hopes for Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova. That's one wing of the Eastern Partnership Program. Very significant because it does lead to this question of the association agreement. Uh, in 2013, there's Barack Obama in the United States. And then there's, of course, Medvedev from 2008 to 2012, and then the tumultuous return of Vladimir Putin between 2011 and 2012 to protests in Moscow in the sense that Russian politics might be moving down a different path. Can you, you know, it seems like a lot of storylines are almost diverging in this period, but how would you characterize this five, six year stretch between 2007 and 2013? Yeah, indeed. Um, now, in, in 2008, it really becomes complicated because in 2008, you have suddenly two different directions in Russia policy. You have the Bucharest decision, which says, well, one day uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become NATO member, which is you know, obviously under pressure from Germany and France, a sort of strange compromise that really didn't help anyone at that point. Um, and you have the Georgia war, which revealed quite I mean, really very openly how different Central and Eastern Europeans and Germany and France were perceiving Russia. So the Georgia war for France and Germany was, you know, a post-Soviet conflict that somehow escalated also because Saakashvili was, you know, uh, too emotional and then uh, Russia overreacted. This was the interpretation of Germany and France and the response was, we need more and not less cooperation with Russia. So there were no sanctions. EU-Russia cooperation resumed after about six months after the Georgia war. And at the same time, we had the Central and Eastern Europeans who were you know, playing a role as Cassandra, so to say so, and saying, look, this is only the, the beginning. This is a demonstration of Russian imperialist ambitions, which were seen completely different in Germany and France. And this also explains why at the same time, you know, we have Bucharest, we have the Georgia war, but why at the same time, Germany is suddenly engaging in a lot of Russia activities. So we have the modernization partnership with Russia that Germany was launching. It's also against the backdrop of the presidency of Medvedev, which um, gave new hope to this kind of thinking that I just described that Russia's future is still open. Medvedev was really sort of the evidence for German policymakers. Look, we can still 
uh, have an impact, we can make a change in Russia's development, let's try again. Let's try to devise new instruments. And also Germany was a little bit yeah, skeptical when it came to the Eastern partnership. It didn't want to play a big role um, uh, in, in its initiation. And it, the perception in Germany was, well, the EU is focusing a lot on the Eastern partnership in those countries there's a lack of Russia policy and we have to fill the support. And then there were, apart from the modernization partnership, which other European countries also established, but you know, with a different outlook, they only wanted economic benefits from a modernization partnership with Russia, whereas Germany actually hoped to achieve a societal modernization in Russia. I mean, with hindsight, it seems quite an ambitious idea, but it was not only about the economy, it was really about the idea, can't we revive the whole idea of Ostpolitik, of change through trade and make an impact in Russian society. That's also why the German foreign minister at the time, who's now the federal president, Frank Rode Steinmeier, gave his speech on the modernization partnership in, at a university in Yekaterinburg, because he thought it's really something for, for Russian society. Um, to, to, to change. And we have then later um, under Angela Merkel, she was very active in you know, trying to establish new security cooperation with Russia. She was very active in the Transnistria conflict. And she basically back at that time promised Russia an EU-Russia Security Council in return for Russia solving the Transnistria conflict. Um, the problem was only that she informed Brussels um, too late of that. So she basically um, agreed with Russia on an EU Russia Security Council without um, the high representative in the EU at the time being involved in, in, in these discussions, which shows again how, you know, to what extent Germany saw itself as um, the main driver in Russia policy and to some extent also representing uh, the European Union. So again, we see these. Uh, outreach, sort of this, you know, we have to cooperate more with Russia, these initiatives. We see that Georgia was perceived differently in, in, in Germany um, and France compared to Central and Eastern European countries. And then we have the Duma elections, which really sort of brought home that Russia's development is not open anymore, that Russia is on a trajectory towards autocracy. And then very quickly, as you mentioned, we have the events in, in Ukraine, the Maidan, the Germany at the beginning tried to stay a little bit in the background, but then finally saw that this can really has the potential to become a major geopolitical crisis and where Angela Merkel then both in crisis management and sanctions policy assumed quite a leadership role to the surprise of Central and Eastern Europeans at the time who were, it sounds surprising with hindsight, but who were at that time actually quite pleased with German leadership in 2014 and, and, and 2000, 2015. It's, um, yeah, important to remember how contradictory the whole Medvedev period was. Certainly the US made some similar analytical mistakes in terms of understanding what was happening over optimism, uh, I think would be a fair characterization. But I think what gets perhaps missed and sometimes with the quick version of this story is that there was a much, there was a, a significant dynamic of growing people to people integration. You know, Russians traveling to Europe, Europeans traveling to Russia, same with the US, uh, something that's going in exactly the opposite direction at the present moment. But there was high politics in Russia in those years and there was the sort of other dynamic and that other dynamic was moving. Uh, really toward greater and greater uh, integration, which at the very least I think helps understand helps us to understand perhaps some of the optimism uh, of uh, of the politicians. Okay, so you've taken us very helpfully, Liana, to 2014. Uh, I think everybody knows what happened in Ukraine in that year. That's not anything that we need to uh, review. Um, but uh, if we could just piece together, or if you could piece together for us the core elements of Germany's policy after 2014. Um, Germany is one of the participants with France, uh, Russia, and Ukraine to what was called Minsk diplomacy. I mean, you could use another format, a form for it, term for it, Normandy format, because of meeting that took place uh, in Normandy. Uh, and I think the theory was in Washington then that it was very good that Europe was doing this, that it was France and Germany and not the US, because this is a European issue, the war in Ukraine, and Europe should be the solution to the to the problem. And I think Merkel. Uh, very much agreed with it. So you mentioned Merkel's leadership. German leadership is an important uh, circumstance. Germany is a big part of the sanctions policy. 
uh, and I think helps to keep a lot of the EU countries uh, on board with it after 2014. Uh, there are two other pieces of the policy that I can recall, and one is that Germany, to a greater extent than the U.S., which really believed in isolating Russia after 2014, didn't really succeed in doing so, but that was the hope. Uh, and so most diplomatic contact between Russia and, and, and the U.S. drops off after 2014. But Germany, I think, had this idea or miracle that you have to keep talking to, to Putin, a little bit like Macron in the present moment. Uh, and also, significantly, it was Merkel who was against the provision of uh, lethal military assistance to Ukraine. There's an anecdote, I don't know how true it is, that she read Christopher Clark's book, Sleepwalkers, and uh, made her worry about World War III. And, um, you know, she sort of argued that there was no military solution to the problem in Ukraine. And it's also said, I, I believe it, but I don't have great evidence for this, that she convinces Obama not to send lethal weapons to uh, to Ukraine. This is a debate that rages in Washington in the spring of 2014, goes on for about a year, and Obama does eventually decide not to send lethal military assistance. So no direct military involvement really of any kind, sustained diplomatic engagement, sanctions, and then what we can think of as minced diplomacy, a kind of agreement that's ha hammered out in 2014, 2015 in two phases that commits Russia to certain things, Ukraine to certain things. And I think that the expectation of Berlin as in Washington was that Minsk would be um, the band-aid that would heal the wound of the uh, of the Ukraine war. Is that a correct um, description? Is there anything that you think has to be added to the German approach to the to the situation in Ukraine, perhaps on, on matters of reform or domestic politics in Ukraine? Yeah, I think, I mean, you mentioned how this was the question of lethal weapon deliveries was a heated debate in Washington. Now in Germany, we also have a heated debate and a lot of reflection about what went wrong since 2014. And that's um, yeah, a debate which is quite quite forcefully conducted right now in Germany because the question is, is the approach that Germany pursued at the time, diplomacy, sanctions, but then to some extent, this idea that we can compartmentalize relations with Russia, that you know, on the one hand, one can cooperate with Russia on Syria on climate change, but on the other hand, you know, there would still be the Ukraine. Um, issue, but it would not necessarily spill over to other areas of cooperation with Russia, and perhaps this would become a frozen conflict in the same way that other post-Soviet conflicts were frozen. So I think in this discussion, one needs to be very careful, you know, not to throw the baby out with the bath water, because it's there were obviously mistakes that were made, and Germany receives um, a lot of criticism for it. But at that time, the Minsk agreements, there really was no alternative to doing these agreements because the Ukrainian army was, I mean, they, they had no chance and they were really at the point of, you know, being destroyed by Russia. So it was obviously an agreement that was concluded to, you know, to the to the benefit of Russia. It was a disadvantage to use a disadvantage uh, agreement to Ukraine, but there was no alternative at the time. Um, what was the problem later with the Minsk agreement was that it didn't work. And instead of thinking, you know, what should be our alternative policy options if this agreement didn't work? And it was interesting that Angela Merkel herself, she had a couple of weeks ago her first public appearance after she, she left the main stage. Um, she said that it was already clear to her at least one year before the Ukraine war that Minsk is not leading anywhere, that Putin does not want Minsk. And so the question there is, why was there no plan B developed at the time? And the obvious plan B would have been weapon deliveries to Ukraine. And for me, this is a symbol of a broader tendency in Germany's foreign policy, but also in Germany's policy towards Russia at the time, which still tried to keep the status quo intact. So it was, you know, the policy was gradually changed. Um, the idea was, well, we have our conflict with Russia, but we still need a basis where we can talk to each other. And at the same time, Russia wanted to overthrow the status quo. And it wanted to, you know, uh, to, 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 to finish the relations we had uh, from the past. And these two approaches collided. Um, and there was no rigorous rethink in Germany's Russia policy, what went wrong and what needs to be adapted. And obviously the main point was the Nord Stream 2 pipeline because it was criticized not only from the United States but also from Central and Eastern European um, uh, countries. Um, and you know there was some uh, 
gradual um, changes to it. So Merkel made sure that um, gas would continue to flow through Ukraine and so on. But the strategic importance of Nord Stream 2 as an energy weapon also from Russia and as a geopolitical liability was not there, was not there in Germany before 2024, really before February um, 24, 2022. And this was, Umar honestly has to say, um, a great achievement of, um, of lobbying efforts in Berlin. I mean, this is really a point where very uh, obviously uh, politics and economics were way too close to each other. Um, gas storages were sold to Gazprom, there was no LNG terminal. So this mixture of economic and um, political interest at that time was really unhealthy. And as we can see now, quite dangerous. Great, so I have only three further questions and I hope our, 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 our audience of excellent students is, is sort of preparing their own questions because uh, that of course is the, uh, is the heart of the matter. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I feel slightly defensive with all the criticism Germany is getting. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not, not myself German, but I do spend time there and I hope it's not for, for sentimental reasons. And one of the reasons I think I feel a little bit defensive is that Americans in particular have the foreign policy types have sort of forgotten about the Trump years. I don't know how it's possible because they're not that long ago, uh, but I think it's because we want to forget about them. Uh, but I don't think um, this is a small part of the puzzle for Germany. So from 2016 to 2020, you have an American president uh, who's not a fan of the European Union, uh, who's um, strangely, at least on the level of rhetoric, conciliatory toward Vladimir Putin, and who's probably his least favorite leader, if one can say, apart from figures in domestic American politics, uh, is Angela Merkel. Uh, and Germany is put in a very awkward position of having a degree of security dependence on the US, a very big economic relationship, a huge historical relationship to the US, but an American president who is, you know, basically hated across Germany. Uh, and among those who don't hate him is considered to be uh, deeply unpredictable. Now, <laughs> the mistakes vis-a-vis -vis Russia are what they are they are in their sort of own objective terms. But if you could just say a few words about the Trump years from a German point of view, then we can go into the, uh, the 2022 war. But I, I do think Trump, you know, is, 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 is a significant, significant part of this picture. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the Trump years were incredibly unhelpful when it came to the whole question of energy security in Germany. I mean, because his criticism that Germany is too dependent on Russian gas, obviously, you know, was true, and I mean, but that's also a criticism that the Commission and other European partners um, have made before. But the fact that this criticism came from Trump, and the fact that he used sanctions against an ally to push through his interests, reframed the discussion in Germany. And those people who argued, you know, we have to be cautious with energy dependency, we have to think about the geopolitical picture about our neighbors suddenly, you know, were pushed back and it became a question of Germany's sovereignty that it should not allow an ally in another country to interfere in Germany's energy policy. So suddenly it really became Nord Stream to continue Nord Stream 2 became an issue of defiance and resistance against Trump rather than a problem in itself. And this really sort of um, uh, made the whole Nord Stream 2 discourse at that time toxic and was not helpful at all because there was no uh, uh, no factual criticism was possible anymore. Everyone who criticized Nord Stream 2 was perceived as well, you're playing, um, you're supporting the Trump stance. Germany should be able to uh, defend itself against uh, US sanctions. And that's also one of the reasons why the Nord Stream 2 debate at that time did not, um, yeah, did not become more uh, uh, critical uh, because it was really just easy to say we have to resist the Trump administration. Yeah, and the value of studying history, I think, is the value of remembering that in 2020 until really until January 7th or 8th, um, Germans could not have known that there would be a president other than Trump in the White House for the next four years. And so that itself is a very significant aspect, I think, of, uh, of some uh, German calculations. Okay, two final questions. One is just the initial German reaction to what happened on the 24th 
uh, of, of February, please feel free to speak in personal terms if you like, or just uh, people you know, sort of friends, the policy community, uh, the German government. Um, obviously, it was a shock, but uh, if you could just sort of speak about the, the way in which this event transformed perceptions, sort of the, the feeling, the sense, the atmosphere in Germany. Yeah, I mean, I was at the time still, still, still in Washington, so I had like the, both perspectives on the discussions in the US and on the discussions in Germany. And I felt, you know, sitting in Washington at that time, that Germany really um, it accepted the evidence that came from the United States. And it knew that, you know, there would be significant, there's a significant risk that Russia might actually invade Ukraine. But there was still this kind of hope that you know, we know Russia better than the United States do, and this hope that an invasion would be irrational. And for me, it's fascinating because it was Merkel who in 2014 said that Putin lives in his own world, which was basically her way of describing that his cost benefit calculus is just very different from ours. And the same idea that from a cost benefit calculus, an invasion would be too expensive um, and would make no sense was very prominent in, in Europe in Europe at the time. Um, whereas in the US, sitting in Washington, it was, I felt it was uh, taken much more serious. There were scenarios developed in Berlin. There was no real scenario planning at the time. Um, uh, so the outbreak of the war came, you know, as a shock, um, also because in the end, Berlin is really just a couple of hours away from Ukraine. So there were frantic preparations for a huge amount for huge numbers of refugees arriving in Berlin, which were not, again, there was no scenario planning and little preparation before, which were not taking place before, because again, it was not assumed that this would, would actually happen. Um, and uh, there was also this feeling, you know, war has returned to Europe. Um, the whole post-Cold War 1990 order is overturned. I mean, even my uh, colleagues here in the office <laughs> went to the supermarket to buy uh, gas cookers, you know. So it really, it, 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 it felt like an immediate war moment for Europe. And there was fear that, you know, this, it, this might not stop. This might not stop in Ukraine. And at the same time, there was um, the resistance from the Ukrainian side was quite a surprise. So I think at the beginning, there was this famous episode where the Ukrainian ambassador in Berlin was told by the finance minister that we should look ahead and think about the Ukraine under Russian occupation. So there really was no expectation, but I guess that's similar to the United States at that time that Ukraine would be able to resist. And one last point, which is quite remarkable, I think, is that within three days, the chancellery and the advisors around the chancellor put together this one speech in the German Bundestag, which now became known as the Zeitenwende speech, the change of an era speech, where basically Germany did a U-turn on three uh, policy areas. It did a U-turn on energy policy. So the speech announced a reduction of dependency on Russian gas and oil. Um, it did a U-turn on security policy. The speech announced that Germany would finally fulfill its 2% goal and um, put up a special fund. And it did a U-turn on Russia and Ukraine policy, um, which means that finally weapons would be delivered to Ukraine, that we would have sanctions on Russia, but also that Eastern European countries would be uh, strengthened with, uh, with a German military, military presence. And this was perceived as quite an ambitious speech, but again, I'm perhaps more on the critical side and you can uh, defend <laughs> Germany, Michael. For me, I have to say that this 180 degree U-turn policy is usually something which I don't really uh, appreciate as you know an ambitious policy, but for me, it's really rather an emergency break because in these three policy areas, Germany was running into exactly the wrong direction. Um, it didn't have to adopt its approach a little bit, like let's say the UK, but it really had to turn around. And that's an argument where I would say, well, there was not enough preparation. It was an emergency way because one just couldn't continue the policies one had at the time. Um, but it was a major, uh, uh, it will be a speed, will be in the history books of um, Germany's history in the 20th and 21st century. Well, your answer to this question, in a sense, anticipated and answered the other question I was going to ask about the Zeitenwende. So, uh, with 
with time in mind, uh, let me turn the floor over to our students uh, and see what questions uh, they have 